Uh, welcome to the very second week of our Black History Month series. Um, we have got Reverend Dr. Tony Hawkins tonight joining us. And actually, I'm going to ask her to give a little bit of a fuller uh, bio about uh, everything you do, because many of you, of course, know uh, Dr. Tony for her involvement in the conference stuff, but that is not all she does. <laughs> there is many, many things um, that Reverend Dr. Tony um, is involved with um, and puts her effort and time uh, into. And so um, we were we are thoroughly uh, looking forward to all that you have to present uh, to us tonight, Tony. And um, what I'm going to do as well is mute everybody as well for our recording purposes. And then uh, if you would, Dr. Tony, just share a little bit uh, more fully kind of the things that you do um, inside the UCC and outside and beyond. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much to the St. Andrews United Church of Christ congregation, to their pastor, Reverend Lori Miller Price, and to their other pastor that I had the pleasure and the honor of participating in her installation, the Reverend Emma Lone. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. And this particular topic that we're going to talk about tonight is near and dear to my heart. So when you actually asked me to consider doing this, I was like, I wonder how am I going to get this um, done? But I'm so glad that I'm able to do this and I'll just share, share just a little bit about myself um, in terms of what you may not know about me. Um, currently I serve as adjunct professor at um, Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary where I um, facilitate the basic preaching practicum classes in the fall and usually during the spring I serve as an adjunct professor with the Lexington Theological Seminary in Lexington, Kentucky with the um, Disciples where I teach the um, UCC History, Polity and Theology course. In addition to uh, working with the seminaries, I also am an online instructor with IMPACT which stands for Ministerial Practices accountability, coaching, and training. Ah, oh, remember. And um, there, there are courses that are offered um, in UCC Poly that we do on behalf of the um, Indiana Kentucky Conference. And as a matter of fact, there's a course going on right now. We are entering the fourth week of that course. It's a six-week online course, self-directed, but is a cohort. So um, they are in community with one another. It's actually all online, except for on Mondays, they have a setting like this where it's on Zoom. And they get to kind of pick one another's brains. We call that a learning hub where they can actually have like study group. But for the most part, they're posting back and forth online. And then they submit a paper at the end of each week, which becomes a part of their ordination paper or e-council paper. In addition to that, I, um, I founded a women's organization in 2001 called Divas for Christ. And that stands for Divinely Inspired Virtuous victoriously anointed sisters and it is comprised of women in ministry from various denominations so uh, it doesn't matter what denomination you are a part of you're welcome to be a part of um, divas and we offer um, workshops we offer opportunities to just connect because many women in ministry are isolated they work in isolation they don't get an opportunity to be connected and to build community this is a way in which they're able to do that and we stress self-care the importance of what are you doing to take care of yourself so that you can be effective in your ministry so I'm gonna stop there because I could go on and on just about myself and then we wouldn't get a chance to talk more about the topic for tonight but I really do appreciate this opportunity to share information with you tonight regarding African-American leaders in the United Church of Christ. So I'm going to turn it back to Emma. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, and just to say as well, the presentation, I think is about 40, 45 minutes. Is that correct? Yes. With some time at the very end for questions. If you do have questions throughout um, the presentation, you can either uh, raise your hand um, and we'll, we'll try and uh, 
Reverend Tony, you don't mind being interrupted, is that correct? Just to no. have the question answered in that moment. Or if it's not time sensitive, you can stick it in the chat and we'll get to it that way as well. Uh, but otherwise, we're so grateful that you're here. Thank you uh, for joining us. And again, if there's any technical issues and stuff, you can hit me up in the chat as well. We can make sure that you can hear and see all that you need to, to engage with tonight's content. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, you have the floor. Well, thank you again for this invitation. And I have quite a bit of information, but I don't know that we'll be able to get through all of it. I have selected for you this evening four um, entities to share with you. Um, three will be individuals and one will be an institution. And so today we will be looking at three African-American leaders who are actually pioneers in the United Church of Christ and one historical um, institution. And I like to call all four of these um, UCC first in terms of our celebration for um, black history. The three individuals we're going to discuss tonight are the Reverend W. Sterling Carey. He was um, the very first African American conference minister in the United Church of Christ. So we will talk more about him. The other individual we will talk about tonight is the Reverend Joseph H. Evans, and they may not be a name that you're not familiar with. You probably know who he is. He is the very first African American president of the United Church of Christ. And then um, a name that we're all very familiar with is the Reverend Dr. Yvonne V. Dell, um, who is the first African-American female ordained in the United Church of Christ. And the institution that we will share some information about tonight is the Franklinton Center at Bricks located in Whitaker's, um, North Carolina. And I'm just going to put this caveat in here really quick, is that I serve on the Board of Trustees for the Franklinton Center. And when I was a seminarian, um, I would go to the Franklinton Center to um, learn more about ministry leadership development and uh, Dr. Delt was one of my mentors at that time and we just stayed in touch and throughout these years I have become um, a, a participant in the things that we're doing through the Franklinton Center through the African American Women in Ministry um, network that we have with the United Church of Christ and Mesa is very much um, active in serving as our liaison between the um, African American women in ministry and what the work that we do at the Franklinton Center. The Franklinton Center is serving um, almost as a um, trying to think like a clearinghouse for information regarding um, African Americans or black people. I like to say black people. So if that's okay with you that I say that, um, that's what I'm going to say. I know it's um, politically correct to say African Americans, but um, I was one of those individuals born Negro on my um, birth certificate. So I got used to being called um, Afro American and then black and I, black I kind of sat with that I was okay with that and then all of a sudden the guy changed to African American I said I can't keep changing my identity I, I'm okay with just being black so the first person I want to talk about um, tonight is the Reverend Joseph H Evans and um, Reverend Evans was born in August of 1915 in Kalamazoo Michigan he was the son of Etta Hill, who was a teacher, and Charles A. Evans, who was a postal worker. Um, Reverend Evans grew up in Chicago and graduated from Inglewood High School in 1933. During his youth, he was an active member of the Church of the Good Shepherd. And in 1939, he received an A.B. degree from Western Michigan University. And in 1942, he received his Master's of Divinity from Yale University Divinity School. And he was ordained in the UCC that same year that he received his MDiv. So that was in 1942 that he was ordained in the UCC. Now, what I want to just share briefly about him, um, I used to teach a course at um, Plymouth 
it was a polity course for lay members called Covenant Life. And it was Covenant Life 1, which was an introduction for new members that would come to Plymouth. So we would do the history of the church as well as the history of the denomination. And we would share information like this. Then I would do Covenant Life 2. That was still a polity class, but it was for existing members of the church. What happened was the existing members wanted to know how come they didn't have um, an orientation about the UCC. And I kind of made an assumption that since they had been there before I got there, that they knew this polity and all about um, the local church and about associations and the conference and the general synod. But they did not know those things. And so we had um, what I call covenant life classes to introduce people so that we could maintain the membership there. I think it's vitally important that we do that. So what I want to share with you about the rest of our time with Reverend Evans is that he was a DD. He was also a dentist and he held the distinction of being the first and only African American to hold the position of both secretary and president of a mainline church denomination in the United States. And between 1967 and 1983, he was the national secretary. So he held the secretary position for the United Church of Christ the longest. And then there was a sudden death among the, um, the president for the UCC at that time was Robert Moss. And um, he died and so Joe Evans uh, was elected to be the president to replace Moss. He served only for one year and decided he'd rather be a secretary. <laughs> and so he went back to the secretarial role. But in um, 1976, he was named the third president of the UCC and the first African-American president of the UCC. And he filled the position, like I said, for one year. And that was from 1976 to 1977 and at that point he returned back to being um, the secretary. I want to just share a little bit more about his um, pastoral roles that he served. For a brief period as a leader of a church mission serving immigrants from Barbados in Brooklyn, New York, he also served as the pastor of Grace Congregational Church in Harlem and he served there for two years from 1942 to 1946 and from 1946 to 1947 he served as the associate general secretary for the Connecticut Council of Churches where he ministered to migrant tobacco farm workers and youth and in 1947 we know this particular church he was called to Mount Zion Church in Cleveland Ohio to serve as pastor until 1953 then he was called to his home church uh, back to Chicago to lead the Church of the Good Shepherd and while he was there in Chicago he earned his doctorate of divinity from Chicago Theological Seminary and from 1960 to 1964, he served as the president of the Urban League of Chicago. So you can see he was very busy um, doing church work as well as serving in the community. And after serving 14 years as the pastor of Good Shepherd, of the Church of Good Shepherd, um, that's when he was appointed to the secretary uh, position of the UCC. In 1983 is when he retired from the UCC, but he remained an active pastor for another five years, even after he retired from um, the national setting. And he served as an interim pastor at churches in Columbus, Ohio, Chicago, Illinois, Portland, Maine, Amherst, um, New Hampshire, and Norwell, Massachusetts. And he actually lived a long life. He passed away in ninth in 2008 because i remember when i was teaching the um covenant life classes some of the members of plymouth actually knew who he was and he was still living at that time he died at the age of 92 so he lived a long life and served um in ministry for a very long time that 
individual was the Reverend Joe Evans, the very first African American president of the UCC, also the very first um, African American to serve both um, positions in the UCC. And we are just excited that we are able to share information about him this evening. I'm going to stop right there and ask if, if there are any questions. I know that kind of took a lot, long time to share that information. So if there was something that you wanted to ask me about before I move to our next individual, we can certainly um, do that. Otherwise, I can go to the next person. All right. Well, the next individual is probably no stranger to you. Her name is the Reverend Dr. Yvonne V. Delk. And um, Reverend Delk is known for many things, but let me just share some of the things that I think you may not know about Reverend Delk. Um, let me see, where do I want to start? I have so much information on her. Um, um, yes. Excuse, excuse me. I was just going to say, I don't, I, my guess is that a number of people don't know who she is. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, awesome. I just, so. All right. Well, then I will share um, the obvious at first and, and move on to some of the things that she was involved in. Um, the Reverend Dr. Um, Yvonne Delt is now retired. Um, she served for 40 years in the UCC. Uh, I had the pleasure of actually attending her celebration of 40 years um, in ordained ministry with the UCC. She is the very first African-American woman to be ordained in the UCC. And her history with this church extends beyond um, when we were uh, called to be united. Um, she is a part of the tradition of the Afro-Christian church and so um, that same Afro-Christian church that she grew up in as a child she is still there serving um, at Macedonia Christian um, UCC in um, Norfolk Virginia one of the things that um, Dr. Delt shared with me and I, I wanted to share the video with you but that video is an hour long so maybe another time I can share that where you get to hear her actual words and her sharing what her experiences were um, coming into the denomination the, some of the challenges that she faced as an African American woman but one of the things that she said to me is that she never became a pastor because um, she just could not be accepted in congregations at that time. And, you know, for many of us who are serving as women in ministry, it is um, women like herself who um, made, who trailblazed the way that we could also serve congregations. So while she never served the congregation, she served at the national setting. Um, she has founded uh, various things. So I'm just going to share um, some of the things that she's done. She was very and still is very much involved in ecumenicism. And um, I am a member of the Virginia Council of Churches, which is where her church is. And we um, nominated her for a, a, an award, which no one couldn't believe that she had never received that before. But she has served more than 50 years in ecumenical um, ministry and that has been a constant in her career so I'm going to share some of the examples um, she was a religious education director with UCC congregations in Atlanta and in Cincinnati and she spent the summer of 1965 with a National Council of Churches ministry to migrants in Michigan later she served on the board of the National Council of Churches Division of Church and Society and was involved in its prophetic justice work and while she was directing urban and black education for the United Church Board for Homeland Ministries we remember those instrumentalities right from 1969 to 1976 she chaired the black church education task force 
of the Ecumenical Joint Educational Development Project. That's a mouthful. <laughs> During her years leading the OCIS and the CRS, here we are with the UCC acronyms now, she was a UCC representative to the World Council of Churches from 1984 to 1997 chairing the World Council of Churches program to combat racism and in 1960 the World Convocation on Justice, Peace and the Integrity of Creation in Seoul, Korea. She has chaired the board of directors of the Ecumenical Social Action Movement for Sojourners and she served as a contributing editor of their um, magazine. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Sojourner magazine. Um, participants in an online meeting watched Dr. Delp receive her award in person. There was an award that was given to her in 2020. Um, and I'm getting a little um, mixed up here. But in 2020, she was given an award through the Virginia Council of Churches on her work in ecumenicism. The award citation described her 60 years of ecumenical service in the fight for human and civil rights for people of color, children, and the poor, and noted that she was work, regularly worked with all denominations and faith groups in the fight for justice, freedom, and equality. She is currently a retired executive of the UCC Office for Church and Society, uh, which is the predecessor of today's um, Justice and Local Church Ministries. And she was also a part of Chicago's Community Renewal Society. So I, I have a lot that I could share about Reverend Delt, but I think that you would benefit more from actually hearing from Dr. Delt herself um, in an interview that I did with her. So I'd be happy to share that with you at another time. I just want to make you aware that she uh, received that Lifetime Ecumenicism Award from the Council at their annual meeting um, in November of 2021. And um, it was the first award ever given to a woman and a woman of color. Um, that's not a good. <laughs> you know that it was the first time given it to a woman and a woman of color in its 76 year history of the Virginia Council of Churches. And um, I just want to say that she's someone who's near and dear to me. She's my mentor. She's someone that I will pick up the phone and talk to when I need um, support on various challenges that I'm facing in ministry. And she has always been there and I really appreciate her for who she is and so I um, finally call her Mother Yvonne because I consider her my spiritual mother in ministry. Um, she actually came here to um, preach my installation as the Associate Conference Minister here in the Indiana Kentucky Conference and she has always just been a mainstay in my life and uh, I really appreciate who she is and um, we always use this um, African-American proverb that says I am because you are and I am an African-American female minister in the UCC because of the trailblazing of a Reverend Dr. Delk who was never allowed to be a pastor but she hung in there many of us would not have stayed under those types of conditions we would have just walked away and maybe tried to start our own <laughs> denomination or go to another denomination she really loves this church and you'll hear more about some of the work that she's doing through um, this other institution that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes but right now I'm trying to find my notes for the very next person that I want to share with you but before I introduce him I want to make sure that there are no questions that you have for me regarding Dr. Delp. Is there anything that you want to discuss I, about Dr. Delp? I, I, I was going to, well my dad might be saying the same thing I was going to say which is when when I was a little girl I think I was um, eight, maybe eight or ten 
mom and dad can tell you. Um, and some good friends, I've told Tony this story before, but it's been a while. Some good, uh, good friends of ours, the, the wife of the couple passed away and we were at her funeral mm. and, and I was at the funeral and this woman got up to preach the funeral. And I looked at my parents and I said, that lady can preach. <laughs> and it was the first woman pastor I had ever seen. And it was wow. Yvonne Delk. So the first, the first woman pastor that I ever saw was also the first black pastor that I ever saw all in one. Wow. And she just made such an impression and, and dad was probably gonna say something similar. Mom and dad were good friends with her too, but, but it just, I never forgot her because it's the first time I ever heard a woman preach. Mm -hmm. She is a powerful preacher, but she's also a very powerful presenter. And what amazes me is that she is now, um, I went to her 80th birthday party, but she is so sharp. I mean, like if I ask her for advice, I mean, she just has it together. I'm like, I, I forget things and I'm not um, 70 or anything like that. So I'm just amazed at her brilliance and her um, ability to really um, strategize and figure out um, things that need to be done in order to really um, have a legacy. And so we will talk a little bit more about the work that she's doing now on behalf of the um, next institution that I will share with you after this particular individual. Dr. Tony, do you yeah. mind sharing the link? You said you had a link of her, uh, like an hour long presentation. Would you share that with me and I can forward that to, to folks? Um, actually, that is part of my polity class. Oh, and so I mind. really um, don't want to share that entire link, but okay. I will be happy to share an excerpt of it or figure out a way that um, one of the things that I um, said to her um, is that I agree. I agreed when I asked her to do it for the polity class that I would not use it outside of the polity class without her permission. I so just allow me the time to speak with her and find out um, if it would be okay. I'm sure she's not going to have any problems with it, um, but I could figure out a way, another way of at least giving um, you some excerpts on areas that I. Um, have not covered tonight that I think would be beneficial for us all. So I'm going to move on if there are no other questions. I I just wanted sure. I just wanted to ask. So you said that she never. So she never had a church. Right. She never had a church. She, she couldn't she, get a church. Yeah, but she was or she became ordained and everything, but she could never oh, yeah. get a church. Okay. I mean, yeah. I I knew I I figured that. I was just trying yeah. to understand to clarify that for myself yeah even if she even though she served at the national mm -hmm. level it was right. not but she couldn't get a church mm -mm. when when was the first when was the first uh this first woman ordained period for um, in the 1800s and we do recognize that in our polity and that was Antoinette Brown so we do recognize Antoinette Brown but when I do the polity class um, when in the Indiana Kentucky conference I do make sure that I mention that um, Dr. Delt was the first African-American um, ordained because it really is part of the history when you think about the Afro-Christian tradition and um, how she left that part to come into a new united church and yet that was never lifted up and so i think it's important um, that i do that when i do get a chance right yeah so the next person that i'd like to um, share with you tonight is the reverend w sterling carey and um just before I tell you anything more about him, I just want you to know that he was the very first African-American conference minister in the United Church of Christ. And he became the conference minister of Illinois in 1974. And I think Dr. Delt was um, ordained um, either in that year or two years later. So here we have Evans in 1974. Uh, we have um, Sterling Carey, who is the first 
conference minister in 1974, and then we have Dr. Dell. And so that's why I chose to highlight them because they really were pioneers at that time. So what I want to share with you about the Reverend Carey, I was trying to find information about where he was born. Here it is. He was born in 1927, August of 1927, in Plainfield, New Jersey. He was one of eight children of Andrew Jackson Carey, who was a real estate broker and a YMCA administrator. And his mother, Sadie Carey, was a homemaker. He ran for student body president of his predominantly white high school and believed he had won by a commanding majority. But the dean informed him that according to the official results, he had been defeated, concluding that he would be more comfortable in an all black school, he decided to enroll in Morehouse College in Atlanta. He was ordained in the Baptist Church in 1948 and he was elected the student body president at Morehouse College that same year and graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1949. He enrolled in Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan where his fellow students elected him the first black class president. He graduated with a master's degree in divinity in 1952. And later he served um, other denominations. He served in the Presbyterian Church and the United Church of Christ congregations, including um, the pastor of Butler Memorial Presbyterian Church in Youngstown, Ohio. And for three years, he ministered to an interracial, interdenominational Church of the Open Door in Brooklyn, New York. I'm going to um, switch really quickly to some of the other things that he did on a national level. He, too, was uh, a part of the National Council of Churches. He was elected um, by unanimously. Um, by the largest ecumenical body in the United Church, I mean, in the United States, called the National Council of Churches. In 1972 is when this happened. He served from 1972 until 1975, and his election set a precedent that he had expressed hope would go beyond the symbolism of the 1960s. And this is, was a. Um, a quote that he said. He said, for me, the symbolic victories don't mean very much. This is what he told the New York Times in 1972. A black is elected to Congress or a mayor of the city, but it doesn't really empower the people. And so it didn't sound like it had a lot of hope, but he also served as a pastor of the use of a UCC church. He was a pastor of Grace Congregational Church in Harlem in 1966 when he helped organize an ad hoc national committee of Negro churchmen. In the July 31st edition of the New York Times, the committee took out an advertisement that embraced the demands for black power being proclaimed by Stokely Carmichael, the newly minted national chairman of the Student Nonviolent coordinating committee and his disciples, which many white clerics and mainstream civil rights leaders were condemning as anti-American and anti-Christian. A quote from him at that time is, what we see shining through the variety of rhetoric is not anything new, but the same old problem of power and race, which has faced our beloved country since 1619. The clergyman wrote, referring to the year black slaves were first imported to what became the United States. While they emphasized that they did not see power as a quest for either isolation or domination, their statement condemned American officials who tie a white noose of suburbia around the necks of black people, relegating them to joblessness and um, dap, dil, dilapidated and still segregated schools and leaving them unprotected by laws against discrimination 
that went unenforced. So he was very much involved both in the church and in social justice movements. He was 65, no, he was 45 at the time that he was elected to the National Council of Churches as their president. And at that time, Ebony Magazine named him one of the most influential African Americans in the United States. And in 1974 is when he was elected as the first conference minister in the United Church of Christ. And so I bring these three individuals up because they both have very powerful um, experiences in our church, but not only within our church, they tried to make a difference outside of the church as well. So I'm going to stop right here and just ask, are there any questions that you have before we move on for me to share about the institution um, for tonight? Uh, Dr. Tommy, thank you for so much for bringing our attention to those folks. A part of me wonders whether the pre there's a always a pressure, particularly for those who are African-American, to have a foot both in the church and outside the church, to have a presence in the wider society, to have a voice that's heard in political spheres, in wider spheres, whether that's um, always a chosen path or whether that's maybe an expected path and how important it still is, I think, for, for pastors to have a strong voice in a broader society outside church? I think part of it, you know, with me being an African-American, I would say probably the um, the involvement in things outside of the church is to kind of help you move forward with what the agenda is that you feel that God has called you, even if your church is not on board. So you can see that they served at very high levels within the church, but they still needed to have that support. We can't do things in isolation. So their community was outside of the church because they were just a small number of people within the church at that time and really wasn't being supported. I mean, look at Dr. Delt, someone who was the very first African-American woman ordained, but to this day never was able to serve a congregation. So, and you can see in her work with ecumenicism that she found her support outside of the church, even though um, this church is her heart. Right. She really loves the United Church of Christ. But who, yeah, who, uh, just a belief and a, and a confidence that their calling goes beyond. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Earl, I think you need to unmute yourself, sir. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned Sterling Carey's referral to the date 1619. Mm -hmm. because I'm saddened to say that was never a date in my understanding as I grew up until very, very recently, as it's been talked about. And I'm in the middle of the book 1619. And mm -hmm. it's what it's all read. And while I knew and worked some with Sterling Carey, I wish I had known at the time that that was such an important date and image and symbol, symbolism uh -huh. and movement that had to be attended to. I'm just so pleased that you mentioned that and to hear that because so many people think that 1619 is something brand new to us. Yes. Many, of, many folk, you and Sterling and many others, knew for a long time that it wasn't new. Thank you. Well, now I want to thank you for bringing that up because you're right. Um, there was a lot of controversy when that professor came out with the book on um, 1619, and uh, many people felt that that was, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, fake news. Um, that that could not possibly been accurate, and this was research that she did. Um, but there are a number of things within the black community that people don't know about. Like when uh, Michelle Obama mentioned that slaves built the White House and there was a frenzy, people were so upset that she said that. And then it was verified. 
but a lot of the information, a lot of the history is really just um, buried or is not meant to get out to the masses so that we can know the true history of our nation. And it's still a great nation, you know, whether we had slavery or not, but we did. Um, we're still a great nation, but we don't want to um, admit that we are a great nation because of the free labor that we got from slaves. And that's unfortunate. So with that being said, I want to share with you the next institution, which is called the Franklinton Center at Bricks. And the Franklinton Center at Bricks is a um, organization that is a part of the UCC. It was a former slave plantation. Um, it was transformed in, in the 19th century by the American Missionary Association um, to an African American school. So it became a school, and the name of that school was called, I think, the Franklinton Christian College. And um, from there, it moved to become what it is now, the um, Franklinton Center at Bricks, which is a social justice conference center and retreat center. It sits on over 256 acres of land. Um, it is an awesome place for having um, camp. It has a pool. Um, we have certain um, walking trails to show you various things that um, took place there when there were slaves. We have there's a big magnolia tree that was planted because it was believed that that was the whipping post. And so um, I will show you a picture of what that looked like and also um, there are dorms there where we have uh, retreats and there was a new building that was built in and there was a conference center inside this new building or a fellowship hall named after Dr. Delk is called the um, Yvonne Delk Fellowship Hall and it is a really nice fellowship hall where very I know the southern um, conference when they hold their annual meetings, they will sometimes use the um, the fellowship hall at Franklinton Center. So I'm going to see if I can share a couple pictures of the Franklinton Center. Okay. Well, that is the area that is called the whipping post. And there are other pictures where there are benches outside around that so you can actually observe um, and a slave who might have been um, whipped for trying to run away or maybe not picking enough cotton and all that greenery out there that you see that is a cotton field um, this place is just beautiful in terms of what it offers in, in um, depicting God's um, creation is just a beautiful place I'm going to um, stop sharing and try to show you the picture of the building where the Yvonne Delt Fellowship Hall resides. So let me try this. I'm going to be so proud of myself if I do this on the first try. <laughs> this is not an easy thing to oh. do to present and then share at the same time. Mm -hmm. Let's see if this works. Yay! It works. Yes, wonderful. Now, um, it's a really close up, so you don't get to see the full thing, but it has a really southern charm. And it also has a brick trail of where people have donated money for a brick. And the whole idea is that there will be a brick trail that'll go all the way around the um the grounds, at least in that immediate area, so people can see. But um, this is the place where many of the galas or meetings or um, services take place. Now I'm just going to share with you the mission and vision of the Franklinton Center and then um, talk to you about the um, Afro-Christian Preservation Project that is 
um, taken place where we've gotten a grant through the United Church of Christ to do some research to really um, be able to demonstrate why the um, Afro-Christian tradition should be considered a fifth string. And I know sometimes when people hear that, they just feel like, here they go again, coming up with something new. But I think that it's always helpful when we can get the information and document it and show just as Reverend Miller said, you know, he didn't know anything about 1619 until recently, yet Reverend Carey mentioned it years ago. So that tells you that there are a lot of things that we don't know only because we have not um, shared that information. And for the African-American um, community, a lot of their information was in oral form. You know, just like the Bible was in oral form and then it had to be written so that people could see what those books were. Well, that's pretty much what the Afro Christian Preservation Project is like in terms of what we're doing to get all this information. But let me share first what the mission of the Franklinton Center is, and it is to provide a nurturing home to local, national, and global programs and organizations seeking liberation. And so at that um, center, a number of various groups come from all over to host their um, events at the Franklinton Center. I just feel like we really need to get more information out about the fact that a social justice conference and retreat center actually exists and it's a part of the United Church of Christ. It used to be under the um, Justice and Witness banner, um, but it now has its own um, separate 501c3. But we are still very much a part of the UCC. As a matter of fact, um, all of the executive directors um, to this point have been UCC pastors and uh, we just had a long-term executive director Vivian Lucas who just um, retired and we now have a new um, interim executive director. The vision for the Franklinton Center at BRICS is to manifest a world where systemic oppression does not exist. The whole divinity of a person is realized. The memory, contribution, and resilience of our ancestors is embraced, and the environment is healed. The, this world embodies the gifts of learning, outdoor play, teaching, health, safety, love, and connection to, be, to the beloved community. And, you know, since the pandemic, we've had pivot, just like other organizations and so they have become a place in which COVID um, testing is done. Um, they are a place that provide food for the local community because it is a food desert where they are even though they grow food and they give food away. Um, it is a food desert in that there are not a lot of stores there. And even when we have our um, retreats for the African American women in ministry, there are more women who show up that we could actually um, have stay there in lodging. So we have to have them go to, I forget the name of the next town over to stay in hotels. So we have overflow hotels because there's not enough room there and so we'd like to eventually add more um, facilities. There is an old schoolhouse so you'll see where the children used to go to school. Um, the dining hall is the old school kind of dining hall where you ring the bell and then you go to the dining hall. Let me tell you the Franklinton Center makes the best food in the world. It is so good because the food is fresh. It's grown there and then they cook it there and it's just wonderful. It's just a big difference in the taste of the food when you go to the Franklinton Center. Today it is a conference retreat and educational facility. It also has a museum there and back in the day there was a post office there so some of the, um, the old um, post office slots are there in the museum so there's a lot that is offered there and one of the things that the African-American Women in Ministry wants to do is start um, 
keeping some of their information there. But right now, we are trying to research all of the Afro-Christian churches. And the majority of them are in the Southern Conference. That Which brings me to the Afro-Christian Preservation Project. And one of the things, well, there are several things that we're trying to do with that project. We're trying to identify papers of clergy men, most of them were men at that time, um, that wrote, uh, we are getting church minutes, um, we are getting um, memoirs, writings, articles, publications, um, some audio and video recordings from way back then so that we can um, really document all that information. We also have a writing project group that their whole role is to do the writing. And what we're doing is working with the United Church of Christ in terms of the information that we would like to see in polity classes in the future. So while I offer Afro-Christian tradition um, in my polity classes, what we want to do is kind of have it standardized that, you know, it's something that the UCC has um, agreed to that they know what that content is and that we're working together on that and so it's taking more time than we had expected because it takes time to actually record all of this information we're also getting photographs of the clergy of um, the convention and I'll tell you a little bit about the Afro Christian convention because that is um, really like the denominational piece of the Afro Christian um, tradition. Um, there are photos of youth and women's ministry, of uh, clergy and their families, and then they even had their own publication at that time. So what I want to share with you is that the Afro-Christian Convention was located in North Carolina and in Virginia, and it existed from 1892 to 1950. But before I jump to that, I forgot to tell you that the Franklinton Center started in 1871. So it started even before the Afro-Christian Convention. The Afro-Christian Con Convention was comprised of 150 churches, 25,000 members, 185 ordained ministers and licensed ministers, it had 150 Sunday schools, and it supported the Franklinton Library and the Theological Institute, which later became the Franklinton Center Christian College. And currently, that piece of it exists in Franklinton, North Carolina, from nine, from 1871 to 18 to 1930. So, at first, the Franklinton Center. Um, started in Franklinton, New North Carolina. And then there was this family called the Bricks that really helped with the school and the school was moved to Whitaker's, North Carolina where the Franklinton Center at Bricks now resides. So I wanted to share that with you and so um, at the Franklinton Center at Bricks is where we have the Franklinton Center Hospitality and Museum Center. And so you'll see all kinds of pictures. You'll see um, pictures of some of the civil rights type movements that were taking place at that time. Um, I think at that time Ben Chavis was a member of the UCC. So you will see that he was actually a part of that and in some of the um, pictures. And I just want to jump really quickly because I know I've been um, talking for a while. It's 730, but what I want to share with you is more about the Afro-Christian Legacy and Preservation Project to tell you what's going on with that. And I'm going to tell you how it got started. So in January of 2017, there was a meeting of the UCC Historical Council um, it was a committee that was appointed to develop a plan to identify, document, and preserve the history and legacy of the Afro-Christian um, heritage of the United Church of Christ. What we found there was that we 
had committee members who surveyed the community and institutional records to locate materials and, and recommend acquisition and preservation strategies to collect, preserve, and provide access to the archives. And um, some of the information that I've been able to get because I'm very closely um, related to this, um, but I don't share too much of it in my courses because this is a work in progress. And so I don't take information that they're currently trying to um, put together and put it out there in the public too soon. But I do um, take the opportunity to have individuals like Dr. Delt tell their story, tell the story for me. So I'm not able to share like paper um, copies of information even though I have access to them. But I want you to also know that the committee reports to the Franklinton Center Board of Trustees and as I shared with you that I am a member of the Board of Trustees and they also report to the Historical Council of the United Church of Christ. And the UCC Historical Council advocates on behalf of institutions that care for various aspects of the United Church of Christ history and heritage. So um, some of the things that they're looking at is financial records. They're actually collecting order of worship. Can you imagine um, getting order of worship? And some of the order of worships they're collecting is from 1892 to 1950. Um, they're collecting newspaper clippings, um, invitations to revivals and special programs, um, church association publications. And so it's just interesting because part of the, let me say, not the agreement when the Afro-Christian convention decided to join the UCC and give up their identity, give up their associations, their conferences, uh, and their ministers became ministers of the United Church of Christ, they did not know that that meant that they would not have their history included in this. And so somehow um, when we talk about the four streams, there's never any mention of the Afro-Christian tradition. At least I'm not aware that has ever been mentioned um, except for among us. Like um, Reverend Miller was saying about the 1619, when people hear about Kwanzaa, they think Kwanzaa is something new. When I was a child, we celebrated Kwanzaa. And I'm like, I'm like really shocked that people didn't know that because it was really prevalent in the black community. So I say all of that to say there are a number of things that we are uncovering, but we want to make sure that we can archive it so that it does not get lost because we don't want to just give information away. And then let's say there's a fire or something happens and then our history is lost yet again. And in these times in which we have technology, it's going to be vitally important that we're able to put these things in electronic form. Um, also, they have organizational charts and church lists to show um, who the members were um, of certain congregations. So this is an exciting time for the Afro-Christian um, church in terms of knowing that their history is no longer going to be buried like um, black history is buried within American history where it's only acknowledged in one month of the year. Well, I believe that black history is American history and that it should be celebrated 365 days a year. I also feel like the Afro-Christian tradition or to be celebrated with the history of the United Church of Christ because they gave up everything to be a part of this United Church. And we are still uniting and we are united. I think our last um, denomination that joined us was the Church of Canada. And so we are the United Church of Christ. Um, I hope that the Church of Canada will not get lost in this because I don't hear a whole lot even when I do my um, polity classes about bringing that up but that is something that I'm going to add at least um, the date in which that happened 
until we can get more information to make sure that we um, share all the information, if possible, about the history of the United Church of Christ and those entities that were a part of making us who we are. We have this social justice thrust because of the Afro-Christian tradition. I firmly believe that they had a lot to do with why we are so focused on social justice and other issues of our time. I'm going to stop there and ask you if you have any questions for me. I'm off. Okay. I was just wondering, uh, back in the old confirmation books for the UCC, you know, they give the history. Mm -hmm. uh, will they be putting the Afro-Christian church in with all the other denominations when we started back in like 57? Will that be changed? It should be put in there if they've been uh, Afro, you know, they have been with the, uh, you know, right. forever. And then they join the UC, you know, they join uh, I was just wondering if they will be putting that in the like confirmation books and that when the kids study I don't know right now uh, what we're going to do on a much broader base right now we're focusing on just trying to get the information regarding the Afro-Christian tradition and we have our own work that we need to do but I do believe that once we're able to share that information with the general body of the United Church of Christ that the United Church of Christ will then make a decision about what they want to include um, just as that has always happened anyway you know that's why it has not been included because it was not a sense of urgency or important at the time I do remember when I took polity that it was a footnote um, that we had these hidden histories remember that reference to um, anything that was not European that um, they were hidden history well no longer is the afro Christian tradition going to be hidden because we have taken uh, the steps to publish that information and share more about the publishing house that they had so I mean there was a lot that was lost in not uh, I guess you don't think being in the church that you need to say Oh, well, we better have a contract to say that this, we're going to be included. You just make that assumption that when you're going to unify, that the unification process would include all and not just some. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and I was going to, I was sort of going to ask the same question that Paula just did, because I remember going through confirmation in the, I don't know, late sixties, I guess it was somewhere around there. Or, yeah. Um, and like 68 and, um, you know, so United Church Christ was all formed and everything. Um, and I don't remember anything being said about the Afro-Christian part. All I heard was the Congregational Christian Church and the German and German Reformed Church. That's all. And then later the Disciples of Christ. I, I know all that, but I had never heard it. it I, I haven't had not heard that. And so. Um, and I grew up here in Louisville, Kentucky. So um, I, you know, I had not. So I just, I'm kind of saying what Paul is saying. And then and uh, something else, as you were talking about how they're looking for orders of worship and all that, mm -hmm. and preserve these different things. I am very involved with singing and choir and stuff. So I started wondering about the music um, and the music traditions because I know that you all, I know that you have that, that, that church had to have them. I'm positive of it from other things that I've been involved with, not here in Louisville, but when I lived in Evansville and had a chance to actually sing with, a, a it was put together to make a gospel choir mm -hmm. um, and the director was a black uh, choir director from and maybe partially minister. I, Mm -hmm. the churches in Evansville and it was very ecumenical it was done with the Philharmonic Court and, but he led us in their songs and it was all oral like we didn't have written music mm -hmm. and we had to learn it that way and that was hard but it was the most wonderful experience I still remember that and that's that was at least 20 years ago so um anyway I would I hope they're doing that part too, is all I was going to say. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, that certainly is a very important piece 
um, Paula and Lynn that that get included because I know that when I used to teach confirmation classes at Plymouth um, I only taught what was provided to me through um, the UCC resources and there was no information regarding our presence so I didn't mention it you know but when you think about it and you see all these black people that are in our denomination don't you wonder how did that happen I mean did they all just, did they all, just all of a sudden decide that they want to join the denomination after it became a denomination or were they already there and I didn't tell you um, that the Afro Christians, they used to worship with the white congregations, but they had to be up in the balcony. They weren't allowed down on the level with the other members because they were black. Well, it got to a point that they weren't even welcome in the church at all. And that's how the um, denomination came about, where they were kicked out of the white church but yet they still had this this polity that was very much congregational they still believed in the jesus as the sole head of the church they still believed in all those things and so they just founded the convention of the south because they could not let go of that you know it's it's interesting you would think that being put out of the church that maybe you would just go to another church but they just still had their own church and so that's how they got so large but they initially were worshiping in white churches but they had to go up in the balcony and then eventually they weren't allowed even in the balcony so so were they congregational churches or yeah what was the, okay okay uh -huh. okay yes they were congregational okay and so you know that that stream the christian congregational church came together mm -hmm. so they were two different denominations then they came together were christian right. congregational right right and so they were a part of that yes okay okay now i understand a little bit but that. then was put out so then they had to start their own <laughs> i understand uh, yeah okay <laughs> any other questions More for any more. I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. But yeah, if there's thank you so much, uh, Reverend Dr. Tony, for sharing with us tonight. That was a whole host of information. I've got a page of resources <laughs> that I've typed up um, as you were talking there that we can include uh, with the link when we send it out to folks. So make sure you check that out. I've got some links for the Franklinton Center um as well as uh, a, a youtube video that the denomination put uh, i think in interviewing i think uh reverend dr delk um oh. around the afro-christian preservation project just a very brief video that's on the ucc uh youtube channel so i can include that as well thank and you i'm going to send you the pdf this is the brochure on the afro-christian um Perfect. preservation project and it has more information than what I shared with you. Um, so I will send this to you as a PDF and you can share that with everyone as well. Thank you so much. We are looking forward to the fruition of that project. That's a lot of hard work behind yeah. the scenes. We've got, we've got a, our congregational archivist uh, in our midst as well. Judy. Really? Who's that? well so some folks really do know the, the hard work that goes into that um, kind of project. It really is ongoing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, we are so grateful to be able to record this and share it with those who, who were not be able to be here uh, today. So I hope the folks that are present will pass that information on as well. Um, Tony, thank you. You are very welcome, Solyn.